we are live now good evening all welcome to i focus online episode 382 and 57th on oculoplasty module today we have one of the most awaited exam special topic long cases and oculoplasty and to discuss on the same we have none other than dr sumit lahane sir from ragunath netralaya mumbai dr sumit lahane sir is truly a multidynamic personality sir did his ms ophthalmology from sir jj group of hospitals he did his fellowship in cornea and refractive surgery from narayana netralaya bangalore sir did his fellowship in ocular oncology and oculoplasty from center for sight hyderabad under mentorship of dr santosh hunawa sir sir is currently assistant professor at sir jj group of hospitals and director of ragunath netralaya mumbai sir is also a managing committee member for uh, maharashtra ophthalmic society sir has been ex scientific committee member for maharashtra ophthalmic society and ex organizing committee member for oculoplastic association of india uh, sir has a key interest in ocular surface tumors tomography keratoconus and post graduate teaching above all sir is one of the most humble and helpful seniors i have ever known so on behalf of entire i focus team we welcome you sir over to you thank you ruju for that nice introduction and uh, thank you cfs and of course dr santosh anav sir for giving me opportunity to interact with all of you <clears throat> so today we'll be dealing with uh, long cases in oculoplasty and in our uh, i focus series i gone through all the modules and we have covered quite extensively about all this uh, cases so uh, i don't want to repeat much of a theory but it is more of a practical importance and uh, it will be what exactly you need to know when you are actually presenting a case and it will be something that you will be asked and what is the ideal answer that is expected from you not too much of theory and uh, not too much of extensive uh, discussion it is to the point answers that we need in the exam so i want to cover few things and two most important of this are one is ptosis and another is proptosis so we'll be focusing more on this and majorly thyroid eye disease in proptosis <clears throat> fellows may not get any interest in this cuz they are already aware about all this but it is more for post graduates who are exam going so today instead of making you present the case i will be presenting a case that what do we expect in the exam and what format do we exactly want so let's begin with the examination format basically we want your case to be uh, divided into all this uh, important uh, points it's a chief complaints history of present illness negative history past history family personal history general and systemic examination ocular examination and most important provisional diagnosis so under this 10 headings we want you to give your presentation so let's begin with the case presentation number 1 this is a clinical picture to show so a 74 year old male presented with the chief complaints of drooping of eyelid since one year and diminution of vision of distant objects since one year history of present illness don't write any short forms try to write complete history of present illness because i have noticed in many of the pre- uh, case presentation they write hop so it's a known short form but try to make it full write as a history of present illness patient was apparently all right a year back when he developed difficulty in eye opening with the drooping of the eyelids which was gradually in onset progressive in nature he developed diminution of vision in both eyes which was again gradual progressive and painless negative history is very important part of your examination if your negative history is good and you are very much aware of your topic most of your brownie points you can get in your negative history itself here i am highlighting extra points that why this the uh, this negative history was asked so there is no history of trauma cause we want to rule out any traumatic drooping of the uh, eyelids no history of contact lens use cause that causes aponeurotic ptosis no history of diplopia we want to rule out, rule out that there is no third nerve palsy or myasthenia no history of variability of the ptosis now the ptosis variability and diurnal variability are two different things 
No history of variability basically rules out blepharocalysis, synkinesis, and the apparent regeneration of the nerve. No history of diurnal variation. This rules out your myasthenia. No history of any ocular surgery, any lid reconstruction surgery, any trauma, any suturing, or any previous uh, ptosis surgery. Many of the times, patient is not aware of the complete history, but you can do see the scar marks. But try and elicit uh, as much as leading history at this point, uh, especially for uh, ocular oculoplastic cases. No history of headache and eye pain. This is important for ruling out Tolosa Hunt syndrome and the migraine. No difficulty uh, history in swallowing, uh, history uh, difficulty in swallowing and change in voice. This is again a very rare disorder, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. No history of any neck mass or any surgery. This is to rule out your Horner syndrome. No history of cardiac complaints. No history of difficulty in eye movement. This is to rule out your CPEO plus syndromes and CF CFEOMs. So this is very important negative history you must be aware of when you are asking. Uh, in case you are not aware of oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy or CFEOM, you can uh, omit those points completely. Past history. Though this may not be very significant in your case, but you need to mention as a part of the format of your examination. Systemic history, patient is a known hypertensive under regular treatment, no history of diabetes, asthma, coronary artery disease. Family history, no history of similar complaints in the family. We'll come back to this, why it is important in a case of ptosis. Personal history, patient has no addictions. Now, in general examination, systemic examination, we know that in exam, we have a very short time provided and we cannot do the whole general examination, but at least we can do mention that patient is conscious oriented with time, place and person. It's okay if you don't mention the pulse, blood pressure, temperature and the respiratory rate completely. Systemic examination, again, it's within normal limits, but even if you don't mention CVS, CNS, RS for abdomen, in detail, it's okay, but do mention that systemic examination as a part of your uh, part of your case presentation. Ocular examination, let it be any case, let it be plastic, cornea, or a cataract. You need to start with these four points: head portion, normal facial uh, symmetry, eye alignment, and extraocular muscle movements. Non-ocular examination. Vision is something that you need to start with. Vision 6 by 12 in the right eye, 6 by 18 in the left eye, which is improving to 6 by 6 in both eyes. Now, while you're describing the finding, try and stick to one eye first, followed by other eye. So you can see that I would be describing the right eye, followed by the left eye. I would be doing same, since here examination is going to be almost same in both eyes, I will be describing one for all of you. So in the right eye, eyebrow is normal in position, eyelids, there is a severe ptosis. Eyelashes, conjunctiva are normal. Cornea, anterior chamber, iris are normal in pattern. Pupil is normal size reacting to light. Lens uh, do show grade 2 nuclear cataract. No regurgitation in the pre uh, pe uh, pressure. And the fundus examination is within normal limits. So left eye similar finding. After that, you can say that I would like to describe the left eye findings and repeat the same findings as we said for the right eye. So once you do that, now you need to come to the important point of examination of the ptosis. So these are certain measurements which are very important. Vertical palpable fissure right always say in all three gazes, primary up gaze and the down gaze. Margin reflex distance 1, 2 and 3. Uh, this has been again extensively covered by Dr. Mritika Sain in her uh, presentation on the ptosis examination. So I'm not going into detail. I'm just mentioning that all these measurements are very, very important when you're dealing with the ptosis case. Margin limbal distance, tarsal plate show, bro fat span, lid crease distance, Bell's phenomenon good, LPS action, synkinesis. All these points are very important. Now this is just to highlight that MRD1 is basically a distance between your hushbuck and upper lid. MRD2 along with the MRD1 uh, completes your vertical palpebral height. Tassel plate show is basically in the primary gaze what you see a distance the uh, between the lid margin and the lid crease. Bro fat span is from the lid crease to the eyebrow. 
in the up gaze basically what you major is mrd3 mrd3 is nothing but mrd1 majored in the up gaze and margin limbal distance is nothing but again in majored in the up gaze so in up gaze you have two very important uh, measurements that is mrd3 and margin limbal distance and why this margin limbal distance is important cause it gives a rough idea for uh, you to plan your surgery like normally MLD normalizes 9 millimeter in Totica, it could be anything. And then you multiply the difference by 3 and you get the value of LPS resection. Just to give an example, suppose your normal MRD, uh, MLD is 9 and your Totica is only 4 millimeter. So you need to multiply 5 into 3 and 15 millimeter is what you get a LPS resection amount. In down gaze, what you measure importantly is margin crease distance. This is important while you are creating a lid crease and you are taking your incision. Now, these are certain again important tests that you need to mention, though you are very sure on clinical examination itself that this is a case of congenital ptosis or this is a case of aponeurotic ptosis. These are certain tests that very important that each and every case of the ptosis, they have to be mentioned. It's ICE test which is negative, fatigue test is negative, phenylephrine test negative. And these are other uh, distances that I have majored here. MRD3, margin limbal distance, as I, I have shown in the pictures before. Once you complete that, you come to a provisional diagnosis. Provisional diagnosis is very important. You cannot just say this is a case of acquired ptosis. You need to give full information to the your examiner so that the whole picture comes in front of them and they also understand that you have understood what case basically you are dealing with. So it's a both eye severe acquired aponeurotic ptosis with the good levator action and the good bell phenomenon with nuclear cataract. Here in examination or uh, here in the provisional diagnosis, we do not want any negative findings. Like we do not want here without synkinesis, without Marcus gun, without this. Yeah, if it is present, then do mention with so-and-so. Like, like for cataract, you mention cataract with pterygium or for ptosis along with proptosis or ptosis along with uh, synkinesis. If it is there, then do mention with. So diagnosis will never have a negative finding. It will only have a positive findings. So just to summarize, when you're doing your ptosis examination, these are very important things that you need to be aware about. There are 16 measurements which I have highlighted on the left side. They have to be there. Three special tests, which is ice test, fatigue test and phenylephrine test, which is again very important. And two phenomena, which is Bell phenomenon and Marcus Gunjovinkin phenomenon. So 16 measurement, three special tests, two phenomena and provisional diagnosis. This is what summarizes your whole ptosis case. I think that makes us simple for you if you remember and you will never miss in, in, in your examination. If you are ready with this format, it will be very cake, very simple cakewalk for you to uh, do the ptosis case examination. Examination done well, history taken well, covers your half the point of your viva. Now, here I am again, as I said, not going into theory. This is completely FAQ based that there will be certain questions which will be frequently asked. Here, I am not covering very detailed questions which are maybe at the fellowship level or much more subspecialty level as this is most importantly for postgraduates and these are the question answers that we expect from them. Very important is the type of ptosis. Either it can be divided as a, according to onset of the disease, congenital or acquired, or according to the cause, which could be neurogenic, myogenic, aponeurotic, and mechanical. Um, very uh, most common here is aponeurotic, which could be involutional or a repetitive traction like a rigid contact lens causing aponeurotic ptosis. Followed by that is myogenic, which could be myasthenia gravis, dystrophies, myopathies, congenital, or blepharophimosis syndrome. Moving ahead, you should know the grades of the ptosis. Grades of ptosis are not based on your vertical palpable fissure height. They are based on your margin reflect distance 1. So margin reflect distance less than 1 makes a severe ptosis. 1 to 2 millimeter is a moderate one and 2 to 3 millimeter is a mild ptosis. This you must know. Of course, there are other ways without doing measurements. 
by uh, knowing the position of the upper lid either it's at the superior border of the pupil which is mild if it covers the half of the pupil moderate covers the complete pupil then it's a severe grade of lupus. third important is the grade of levator action which could be more than 8 millimeter 5 to 7 and 3 to 4 millimeter accordingly classified as a good fair and poor all of you are very much aware that why this is important because based on this the surgical management of the uh, surgical management of the disease is decided you will be asked what is pseudotosis these are just four pictures highlighting it anophthalmus dermatocalysis hypotropia atropic bulbi all these diseases basically mimic uh, it to be a tosis condition but none of them is a totic basically what is Bell's phenomenon? Bell's phenomenon is also known as palpebral oculogaric reflex. It's basically upward and outward rolling of the eye on the closure of the eyelid. It could be normal, it could be reverse, inverse, pre-reverse and basically you should know good, fair and the poor. Poor one is when on closing the eye less than one third of the cornea is covered. So again as I said I am not going into detail but a simple uh, thing, a logical answer which all of you should know that uh, why the Bell's phenomenon happens. So I was not going to ask any questions to the fellows, but I just want them to not to sleep. So just simple, simple questions for all of you in between. Farnas, can you tell me what is, which nerve is responsible for Bell's phenomenon? Uh, sir, on closure of the uh, eyelid, uh the uh, eyeball has to roll upward and outward so basically the facial nerve is also involved over here so that there is no uh, corneal exposure changes yeah but facial nerve is not going to move your eyeball up and out okay yes. it is your third nerve oculomotor nerve which is a motor nerve which will be creating the bell's phenomenon okay yes, let's move on now, how to differentiate from the myogenic ptosis? Again, like I said, there are three important tests. Ice test and the fatigue test. In every case of the ptosis, every time you see it primarily, you are going to do this test. And all of you are aware, how do we do ice test? We keep eyes for two minutes and then we measure again more than two millimeter is found to be a positive ice test. Suppose your ice test and the fatigue test are borderline. Like that, they, are, they may, may be like one person is doing, they're coming positive. Second time somebody is doing it, it's coming negative or the the increase is not 2 millimeter, it's only 1 millimeter. Then to confirm it further, you can do a new stigment test. Now just to add on here, what is false negative eyes test? Again, this is to not to make you sleep, nothing else. Dr. Ashwitha, can you try and answer? You need to unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Uh, so there will be improvement in the MRD1 post ice test. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure, sir. I don't know. Ruju wants to attempt. Achha, okay, for, before that, Ashwita, since I didn't cover this point, how does ice test work? You have any idea about that? The acetylcholine esterase enzyme is uh, um, correct. So it's, down a, and... it's a cholinesterase enzyme, so more of acetylcholine is there present now in the synaptic junction, and then suddenly muscles start contracting well. So, what is false negative? Ruji, you want to attempt? Sir, uh, maybe it is a case of myogenic ptosis, but still we don't get the eye spec test positive. Matlab, there is no improvement in ptosis post eye test. Yeah. So what I meant by false negative is it's a case of false negative, uh, uh, sorry, case of a myogenic ptosis. Still, you don't get improvement because generally what we say that your eyes has to be there for two minutes. But suppose if there is an overzealous person examining and he thinks that I want to make the test positive and he keeps the eyes for five minutes, suppose, more than that. So the whole muscle uh, temperature reduces and the contractility of the fiber reduces. 
so after 5 minutes if you keep even if the muscle has a myogenic ptosis it does not contract well just because the temperature of the uh, muscle fibers is reduced to a certain extent where they are not able to contract and that's why you get a false negative test so don't be very over zealous and when patient is saying that i am feeling very cold you can stop the test then and then now let's move ahead this is again a simple question that they will be asking you in the exam that how do you do ptosis measurements in a vertical muscle squint it becomes difficult to do that but the answer is very simple that you do a cover test try to bring this eye in a primary position and then do your measurement suppose in your examination you just do the measurement in this case and write your mrd1 to be minus 1 you basically make a blunder here so be very careful in such cases now like i ask you what is the significance of the family history this question again will be asked there are multiple answers available but two most important diseases that you should be aware of is the blepharophimosis epicanthus inversus syndrome it has a four components blepharophimosis blepharophimosis nothing but the shortening of horizontal fissure ptosis all of you are aware of epicanthus inversus is nothing but a skin fold which is running inward and upward from up uh, down, uh, lower lid to upper lid and telecanthus is basically the distance between two cantha is increased but the distance between pupil is completely normal correct that is telecanthus so what is that is called as when the distance between canthus is also increased and interpupillary distance is also increased Parnas, you want to try? Usually occurs in hypertelorism, sir. Correct. Uh, occurs in hypertelorism, where basically here it's only a soft tissue abnormality. There it's a bony abnormality, where actually orbital sockets are away from each other, and that's why the complete distance of cantha and the pupil is increased. So when you you talk about telecanthus, they will ask you about hypertelorism. Very good. now in this you should know that there are two types one and two one is basically all four features with ovarian failure and two is all the features without ovarian failure so just remember one the second is without if you know this well and good it's more common in the women that's what i wanted to highlight another disease that you should be aware of is the congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscle this is very rare 1 in 2 lakh 50000 birth again it is very rare in the uh, uh, area that we live indian asian population this is again this mimics the cpo more than anything else there is complete ophthalmoplegia with or without ptosis as all the muscles supplied by the third nerve are affected only uh, way to differentiate it from the cpo on the history is that cfum is present since birth and of course there will be a dominant or and the recessive pattern now for surgeries uh, at pg level what do we expect is that you should know for the case that you are presenting and the similar cases what kind of uh, surgeries are available and what is the best choice of the surgery so i'm just putting three scenarios in front of you it's a patient with the mild ptosis levator action more than 10 mm well defined lid fold no exist skin and you will plan what type of surgery here you will plan fasanella servet or muller ectomy cause it's a mild ptosis suppose it's a moderate to severe ptosis levator action is equal to or more than 4 mm then what will you plan you will plan a levator resection in this case and suppose it's a severe ptosis like in a congenital one levator action is very poor and there is a synkinesis is also present you can try doing a sling surgery now like i said i am not going into details on this but there are two questions two answers that all of you should be aware about uh, which i will ask uh, farnaz for the sling surgery what are the materials you are aware that we can use just two is good enough 
uh, we can actually use the uh, silicone, sir, which we usually use. And uh, the uh, other one is the fa uh, facial lata can also be used. Correct. Now, I want to know two complications of ptosis surgery. All these surgeries have two complications in common. Ashweta? An overcorrection can cause uh, in exposure keratopathy of the inferior cornea. Or uh, also, if the suture bites have been passed uh, deep through the tarsus, it can cause. Uh, Agreed, but in all, we will not pass a suture bite. So, first, you said is exposure keratitis. What I wanted from you is a lag of thalamus. Yeah. The lag of thalamus is always happen because you're shortening the upper lid basically. So, and lag of thalamus, the sequel of the same is exposure keratitis. The second thing is you should tell them there is a there will be lid lag. Lid lag in the sense when they are looking in the down gaze, the lid operated will have a larger palpable fissure compared to the non-operated lid. So these two complications are always there in any kind of surgery or process that you are going to plan. So for the surgeries, I would just say that these are few important points and this at least these three surgeries and complications you should be aware about. That completes our ptosis case. We'll move on to the another case. Again, I am going to present it for you. And that, how do we expect? This is a, this is a patient with bilateral uh, protrusion of eye. So this patient presented with the chief complaint of a 45-year-old male, chief complaint of protrusion of eye, which he noticed in six months. In the present illness, he was apparently all right six months back. When he noticed increase in the size of the eyeball with the protrusion associated with the redness, pain, which was gra gradual in onset and progressive in nature. In negative history, there is no history of trauma to the eye, traumatic proptosis, no history of variability, which is more important for vascular causes, no history of diplopia, diplopia we will talk about. Muscular involvement or the nerve involvement. No history of swelling anywhere else. You want to rule out metastasis because orbit is a very common site for the metastasis from other primary systemic tumors. No history of loss of weight and appetite has to be asked even when you are very sure that what case you are dealing with. No history of ocular surgery. Could be some biopsy or something has happened and patient has a recurrence. No history of headache. Again, you want to rule out some systemic causes. No history of loss of vision is important. Here, our patient has not complained about loss of vision, uh, which is generally an optic nerve origin or the retinal involvement. No history of watering. Acute and chronic dacrocystitis can lead to orbital cellulitis. And orbital cellulitis is most common cause for proptosis in cases of children. Past history, no similar history, no history of similar complaints in the past. He's a known hypertensive thyroid disease under regular treatment, no other diseases. Family history, no history of similar complaints in the family. No uh, personal history, patient is a chronic smoker and alcoholic. Again, like in general and system examination, patient is conscious, oriented with time, place and person. Rest is the similar thing. I am not going into detail of that. I have cleared. Ocular examination, extraocular muscle movements are restricted in all gazes. Otherwise, head posture, facial asymmetry, uh, symmetry and eye alignment are normal. Again, here, visual acuity will mention. And you will describe one eye at a time. So, I would be describing right eye for all of you. Just for the revision side. Eyebrow is normal. Eyelid shows lid retraction which is 3 mm superiorly, 2 mm inferiorly. Eyelashes are normal. Uh, conjunctiva shows congestion especially at the bulbar conjunctiva and at the canthi region. Cornea, anterior chamber, iris, pupil are normal. Lens is clear. Patient's intraocular pressure in the right eye is 28 mm of mercury. Fundus is normal. Left eye again similar finding but the pressure is 30 mm of mercury. Now, these are very important points which we must notice uh, in case of our uh, examination, which is pulsations. 
रिट्रोपल्शन प्रोप्टोसिस ब्रुई वेलसलवा एंड पोस्ट बेंटेस नो मैटर विच एवर केस ऑफ प्रोप्टोसिस यू आर लुकिंग एट द वेलसलवा एंड द पोस्ट बेंटेस्ट हैज टू बी डन and now we reach to our diagnosis it's a chronic proptosis of both eyes in a patient with thyroid eye disease most likely thyroid eye or vetopathy with clinical activity score now again clinical activity score is the important measure which we use practically to uh, talk about the activity of thyroid disease so if at a postgraduate level you are very much aware of that and you write that in your provisional diagnosis that gives you more brownie points because that tells the examiner that you are aware about active and inactive thyroid disease and of course then your viva can move on to the treatment guideline instead of uh, going on to the other place so here i will be discussing and asking you certain questions because you keep on saying orbit cases and in case i miss something or you want to add up a point you are most welcome so it's very important that what is the time course of disorder is it acute subacute or chronic visual symptoms i have uh, just spoken about it but still again i will since it's a case of thyroid eye disease which will most commonly be there in the exam uh, can furnas tell me uh, two three important causes of loss of vision in thyroid eye disease patient uh one is corneal exposure uh, keratopathy and uh, the other one is optic neuropathy correct what yeah. happened this is a very severe proptosis sometimes you do get choroidal fold sometimes you do get exudative retinal detachment as well in the severe cases sometimes if the patient is a chronic uh, uh, thyroid eye disease patient and intraocular pressure is high then they do get glaucomatous optic nerve changes and that can also lead to the loss of visual pain and slowly visual acuity if the glaucoma advances so these are very important points in thyroid eye disease if they ask you what are the causes for loss of vision you should be very much aware of that good attempt has there been any pain pain is very important in cases of proptosis as it will differentiate between are you looking at a neoplastic ones inflammatory one or the benign ones benign and the <clears throat> neoplastic will not cause pain unless they are very large and they are causing a proptosis which is leading to either a stretch optic neuropathy or they are causing a keratitis but the inflammatory one like acute dacryoadenitis will cause pain immediately so pain will differentiate between your inflammatory and non inflammatory one any diplopia history of trauma with this is all we have covered into a negative history now aggravated by specific manner coughing straining nose blowing this is very important in adults and more important in the children because they will not be giving any history but parents must have noticed that there are changes when child is crying and sudden there is enlargement in the a uh, proptosis that they have noticed and that point out towards the vascular anomalies that patient is suffering from these are five most important classifications of any orbital lesion infection inflammation vascular neoplastic miscellaneous just to highlight all this are very much common in uh, children orbital cellulitis parasitic infection cystithocosis and abscess especially post trauma nsoid thyroid related orthopathy granulomatous inflammation little in the middle age vascular can ha happen to any one cavernous hemangiomas lymphangiomas and av malformation neoplastic uh, lacrimal gland tumors paranasal sinuses or malignant tumors and the rare ones are miscellaneous which is Uh, either a sinus lesion or intracranial lesion extending foreign body granulomas and the trauma again response to the steroids or the prior treatment received this is again important like we had asked for any ocular surgery or any other treatment done in such cases because if the patient has responded to uh, respond to the steroid that means patient is suffering from some inflammatory lesion that rather than a neoplastic lesion always check for old photograph 
family history very important especially in the endemic country like we are living is of the tuberculosis surgeries histopath reports and the rest we have covered examination has three important points inspection palpation and auscultation and you must be doing all this in all the cases of proptosis that you are getting inspection we should not miss the temporal fullness because this all gives you very much clues to your diagnosis you can clinch diagnosis just by the looking at the patient coming into opd cutaneous or the intraoral vascular region orbital lymphangioma many times has other lesions as well scaphoid spots for the neurofibromatosis lid retraction points more towards your thyroid eye disease than anything else talman patch for your lymphomatic lesions and some congenital hemorrhage which could be a wide variety of the blood diathesis lesions so all this on inspection has to be noticed mind you i did not say all this as a negative finding so as in your examination we just expect you to give a positive finding but since proptosis is a huge uh, uh, case and you should be aware of all these things so i am highlighting other things that you should be knowing in the inspection as well we need to rule out pseudotosis pseudoproptosis which could be high myopia unilateral lid retraction which is which could be non thyroid buphthalmus and the uh, ptosis in the other eye axial or eccentric proptosis this has to be mentioned i am sorry i forgot this in a diagnosis that you should mention that what kind of proptosis you are dealing with our case was axial proptosis so this is eccentric proptosis where some other lesion in the uh, orbit is basically trying to push uh, the eye outside the orbit this is nabziger test again we we uh, very well know uh, our worms view and the birds view but classically this is known as a nabziger test where you stand behind the patient tell the patient to extend the neck in 30 degrees and then you see which eye is proptos of course we do hurtles we do other exophthalmometry but this is very important clinical test that you must be aware about while you are appearing for your uh, long cases in plasty coming to the palpation orbital margin has to be palpated though with the history of the patient you are very much sure that this is a case of thyroid eye disease and there will not be any mass palpable still orbital margins are well palpated retropalpation has to be attempted again because there could be a component of the vascular uh, mass as well and if the mass is palpable you should comment about the consistency tenderness reducibility and the posterior extent we had no mass here but you you may get especially the lacrimal gland masses you are very much palpable their anterior ones you must mention about the size that you are able to palpate and the uh, consistency of the mass measurements we do have hurtles in examination suppose you don't have to be ready with the two scales cause in examiner might ask you the two scale technique more than your exophthalmometer so you are you must be aware of the uh, two scale technique i think again this was covered in your proptosis lecture i am just showing that you need to mention the horizontal displacement which is from the center of the root of the nose to the limbus and the vertical displacement this is measured by the distance from the scale to the 6 o'clock of the limbus by keeping the scale uh, horizontal in front of your eye or the patient These are various exophthalmometers. They may not show you at some centers if all the exophthalmometers are available. They might show you. Two most important you should be aware is the first and the third shown in the picture. And I think again this was covered, so I'm not going into detail. Anterior segment examination, as you do in all cases, very important. Pupil, especially RAPD, has to be mentioned. because that tells you about the optic nerve status though it's a long case many times you might get patient in a dilated form so then you do mention that patient is already dilated uh, pharmacologically so you cannot comment about the rapd you must look for lish nodules you must look for color vision in case you have uh, see, uh, missed the rapd since the pupil is dilated color vision is something that will tell you about the health of the optic nerve and diplopia testing 
post year segment examination very important because it will tell you about the origin of the tumor you might be dealing with the optic nerve sheath meningioma gliomas or there could be retinochoroidal fold all has to be seen on the dilated posterior segment examination so that is very important in cases of proptosis especially the acute ones imaging they might or might not give you uh, but proptosis with the extraocular muscle thickening is the favorite favorite question of all the examiners since you are going to see that this is a case of thyroid eye disease and there is a proptosis they will ask you cause of the proptosis which is again either a fat enlargement or the muscle enlargement the next question will be what are the other causes other than thyroid of extraocular muscle thickening can any one of you wants to attempt at least four causes of the same ruju from myositis uh, lymphoma hydrated cyst and um, uh, neoplastic uh, uh, metastatic uh, okay more common is vascular either you have a cavernous sinus lesion <clears throat> or you have av malformation or you have ccf long standing one all will have a dilatation of the muscles and myositis as you said correctly is a very very important differentiating point uh, and the most important differential diagnosis post duction test do we do this in opd generally we avoid especially in exam but in case examiner ask you you should be aware about that how do you do it this is more important in cases of your traumas suppose you have a case of orbital fracture which is again less likely to be there in the post graduate exam and a patient has a, a hypoglobus hypotropia then they might ask you the use of fdt to know that the, your recti muscles are added in the fracture either medially or inferiorly so restrictive pathology fdt will be positive and if you feel a resistant try to globe try to move the globe it is going to tell you that there is a a uh, restriction somewhere and not a par paralytic one differential tonometry is important in cases of thyroid uh, uh, disease since we have mentioned here that there are all the muscles uh, those are being involved correct so there is no one particular direction in which we are checking the pressure but suppose the case would have been that the superior movements are restricted and in those cases the patient's pressure will be high when they are looking into the restricted gaze like up gaze and if it is more than 5 mm than the primary gaze then that is again because of the muscle restriction this happens very commonly in the thyroid uh, eye disease uh, so uh, just to add a, a point here uh, in cases of uh, uh, thyroid eye disease like i told you the muscle is restricted and it does not move in a particular gaze so very common question that is been asked in cases of thyroid that what are the causes of the gaze restriction in thyroid eye disease you want to attempt farnas like suppose i am unable to move my eye superiorly i am a patient of thyroid eye disease what are the causes for the same um, sir uh, it is usually because of the involvement of uh, the belly of the muscle in the disease and there is also um, involvement of the soft tissues around the uh, disease sorry around the muscles uh, so there is a particular pattern like first inferior rectus will be uh, uh, involved and thereby you know in up gaze uh, the intraocular pressure will vary so you are partially correct that inferior rectus is the first to involve ruju you want to attempt cause for the restriction of the movements in thyroid sir first as farnas has rightly mentioned the involvement of uh, muscle bellies second uh, would be uh, there is a increased fret uh, standing so uh, uh, basically two causes paralytic and restrictive causes so most important you need to say along with the inflammation is the fibrosis of the muscle so over a period when the thyroid eye disease is not active the inflammation settles down completely the muscle undergoes fibrosis 
and because of the fibrosis it basically basically restricts the movement completely that's why there is a, a difficulty in the movement in the opposite case like your inferior rectus is fibrous you won't be able to move the eye in the up case valsalva and post bend test as they are very important and uh, you know how to perform valsalva again that has been covered that basically increases the vascular pressure and any vascular malformation or varix increases uh, post valsalva or post bend test and you need to do a photographic documentation in all cases of your orbital disease Schirmer test, again, we miss out on your proptosis cases, but this is again very important. This is the a function of a lacrimal gland. Most of the tumors that we have in orbit could be a lacrimal gland tumor. So you are having a case of either a thyroid eye disease or a lacrimal gland tumor, Schirmer test has to be done. Again, what is the importance of the Schirmer test? Like I told you, the inflammatory lesions and the neoplastic lesion needs to be differentiated. So inflammatory lesion will affect the lacrimal gland function very quickly and in cases of dacroadenitis your Schirmer test will reduce immediately but your neoplastic masses of the lacrimal gland or benign masses will not have a reduced Schirmer test till they are so much increase in the size that they completely destroy the architecture of the lacrimal gland Schirmer test will be completely normal in them. So in any lacrimal gland lesion or for that sake any proptosis case, the Schirmer test and the Schirmer's value has to be mentioned. Auscultation, very important. Even in cases of thyroid eye disease, uh, don't miss out doing it. Uh, this is again uh, done uh, with your stethoscope and uh, tell the patient to close the eye and try to uh, hear the bruvi and uh, do practice this in your clinic. So in your exam, it becomes easier for you they might tell you to demonstrate and uh, this what clinically tells you about uh, that you are dealing with the vascular lesion than anything else. So your inspection, palpation and auscultation are very important in, in uh, cases of all cases of proctosis. So this slide I have purposely put, this is what they will be asking you clinical activities for. There, there are three things that you should be aware as a postgraduate when you are giving the exam. First is the no specs classification, though we don't use it, but this is what was the historical significance. Second is the clinical activity score and third is the visa classification. Clinical activity score basically point out, uh, out, uh, out towards your symptoms of a pain and signs of chemosis, eyelid, conjunctival injections and eyelid injection. And all in all, if your score is more than four, then you consider this as an active disease. So this is very important chart that all of you should be aware about. The newer than this is a visa classification. Again, which we don't use it uh, in a for the practical purpose, but for theoretically, you should be aware of. Um, Parnas, for everyone's benefit, can you just tell the full form of visa? Uh, v stands for uh, vision. And uh, uh, I stands for uh, inflammation, so which is actually manifested by the uh, conjunctival chemosis, all that. Mm. Mm. As for, I'm actually not remembering it, sir. So. You want to try Ashwita? S is very simple, S for something. S for strabismus, strabismus and A is for appearance. Yeah, S for strabismus. And last one will be? Appearance. A for appearance. Correct. Very good. So, visa is something that you all should be aware about. Now, these are certain cases that... Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, going ahead with the investigation. Since you go ahead with your case uh, and suppose you are able to answer all this, all your classifications, they will of course go ahead with asking you that what investigations you will do. Now for investigation, I always tell them that talk about the ocular investigation and then the systemic investigations in that scenario and then the imaging. Try and divide your investigation into three these three modalities. 
Correct. So for ocular examination, you have done the test post, band, valsalva, auscultation, all these are very important. Now other investigations, which are blood investigation, very important, like thyroid eye disease, you will do T3, T4, TSH. Will obviously do blood sugar, fasting, BP levels. Um, you will uh, rule out any inflammatory uh, disorders. For that, your uh, serum A's, C anka, P anka, ANA, all collagen vascular disease uh, workup. And then you move ahead with your imaging. Imaging will be either a computed tomography or magnet magnetic resonance imaging, MRI or CT scan of a particular thing, orbit or a, a brain plus orbit or whatever with contrast, without contrast that you need to tell and you need to also tell that what will you be expecting in this. For example, suppose I come to the part of the viva where this case is being discussed and they ask me what imaging will do and I um, answer as it's a magnetic resonance imaging sir where with contrast images I would like to see and I would be expecting that there is either a thickening of the extraocular muscles or in both eyes as I am suspecting a thyroid eye disease or increased fat standing as I am suspecting a increased inflammation in this case. When you answer that way, it, it basically gives you a lot of brownie points and they don't ask you further questions since you are aware about the investigation and what do you want to expect out of that investigation. This is how you answer. Now, again, coming to the certain discussion point on this case, like which I had specifically mentioned, like this thyroid eye disease patient uh, needs certain treatment, a medical management and also the lifestyle modification. So what important lifestyle modification advice we give to the thyroid eye disease patient, Ashwita? That's why the personal history was been put. Uh, to avoid smoking. Correct. So avoid all form of smoking active at the past. Yes. Because that increases the relative risk of uh, thyroid eye disease being uh, very uh, aggressively active. That is very important. Correct. Now, when I say uh, active thyroid eye disease, how do you manage that medically? Suppose if T3, T4, TSH levels are controlled, you do an endocrinologist reference and they are all controlled. What is the line of management from your side for th active thyroid eye disease? Sir, so we start the patient on uh, intravenous methylprednisolone for six pulses. So followed by you know, modulation. Correct. So basically you want to put patient on an anti-inflammatory regimen. And oral steroids in such an active disease may not work. So you want to shift patient on the intravenous methylprednisolone and then add a immunomodulators like azathioprine or the mycophenolate morphetin. Correct. So this much what is expected from you. Now, next, if you answer all this, then only your viva will go on the surgical treatment. Then only your viva will go on the surgical treatment of the thyroid eye disease. Surgical treatment is indicated when, like we discussed, there is a exposure keratopathy, loss of vision, and there is a stretch optic neuropathy or there is compressive optic neuropathy. So there is RAPD, loss of color vision, and uh, the orbital volume is very much increased. Then we plan surgery called as orbital decompression surgery. Then we plan an <laughs> orbital decompression surgery, one wall, two wall, three wall depending on the severity of the disease. These are just simple cases that I have highlighted. So this, this point of description also gets covered here. So here is a female, we can see a 50 year old female presented with the proptosis in the right eye. And when we do a CT imaging, we see a well-defined mass here. So for everyone's benefit, uh, Farnas, can you describe the CT pictures here? Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, the right orbit actually shows a well-defined uh, uh, round to oval lesion uh, in the uh, uh, lateral, like uh, central to lateral aspect of the uh, right orbit. And... Uh, uh, 
it is uh, actually um, abutting the uh, superior rectus. Mm. It's between the superior rectus. And the uh, lateral rectus, sir. Uh, lateral rectus and also the optic nerve. So basically, this is present superolaterally <clears throat> in an intragonal compartment, well defined one. And always while you describe CT scan, do say that I am describing an axial scan here or I am describing a coronal section here which shows so and so. So that gives them a better idea that you are aware, aware about the scans as well. So uh, for everyone's benefit, this was a case of cavernous hemangioma. Parna, you want to try this? Young male present with the right eye. Abaxial proptosis, and this is his axial and the coronal section. Okay. Um, so uh, the uh, uh, axial uh, scan shows uh, an ill defined mass which is uh, present in the uh, left, uh, as I mean, left, uh, sorry, lateral aspect of the uh, right orbit, and uh, um, the mass is actually uh, causing uh, um, the globe, I mean, it, it is actually pushing the globe downwards and uh, it is also like uh, involving the uh, lateral rectus muscle. So probably it could be of uh, lacrimal uh, um, origin. Basically what we want from you is a well description. It's okay even if you go wrong with the diagnosis. Here it's quite well defined, not badly defined. It's a well defined isodense mass, okay, which is there in the right orbit, extraconal compartment in the superotemporal aspect, which is basically abutting on the globe itself, pushing it down, and it is also causing certain bony changes. If you notice, there is excavation of the lateral wall of the orbit and also the roof of the orbit. Understood. So this is what is happening with this. Now, the lacrimal gland in the provided scans is not seen separately. So this could be a lacrimal gland origin tumor. In young patient, what is the most common lacrimal gland tumor? Pleomorphic adenoma. Correct. That's the most common benign. And what is most common malignant tumor of lacrimal gland? Adenoid cyst. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> so this is what is expected from all of you maximum they will be showing a case of either a lacrimal gland tumor or a case of thyroid eye disease to be more common there may or may not be the images present but uh, you may not reach to the diagnosis completely but do your examination very thoroughly try to mention your provisional diagnosis in case you are not very sure like in this case we were very sure about a thyroid disease. Do mention a differential diagnosis. Like if there is a, uh, a baxial proptosis like this, you don't have images, then you can say that this, there could be a lacrimal gland tumor. It could be a dermoid cyst or it could be uh, any other uh, pseudo tumor. It could be IgG4 related disease. You can give multiple differential diagnosis in cases of proptosis. If you are not very sure, especially unilateral proptosis and not a classical case of thyroid eye disease, then do give a differential diagnosis in such cases. I decided not to ask you many questions, but happened to ask you a few in proptosis ones. So I would like to end my topic here. I would like to, of course, uh, acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Santosh Anasar, and my colleagues and friend, Dr. Mrithika and Dr. Sonal Yadav for helping me with the clinical pictures. Thank any, you so much, sir. Thank you. Any questions, anything, anything that we missed? This is, again, not for your fellowship level. This is just for the postgraduates who are about to, about to appear for their exams. And this is what my, uh, minimum expected from them. And this is these are the FAQs and the answer. They should be answering in the exam. Even if they go through this class, they should be able to uh, answer most of their questions in the live. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. You actually detailedly covered how to take a history, present a history, and how to precisely answer this question. I remember even last year, you and Akshay and I, sir, had taken long and short cases in oculoplasty. And that was really helpful for my uh, 
exam practical ophthalmology exam so uh, thank you very much again for covering it extensively sir so thank you ashwita thank you parna thank you ruju and thank you cfs and santosh sir for this nice platform and uh, hopefully we'll touch the 500 lectures soon yes sir um before that a uh, kind of announcement um all the post graduates we are conducting the i focus offline national post graduate education program uh, this will be held on uh, june 19th to 16th 2024 and this will be held at hyderabad the registration is limited only to 300 candidates so please register yourself online as early as possible the link is given below and you can click on the link and register for it it's going to be a great session and um, you have to definitely come uh, and you know it will really help your exams yeah uh, before we call it a day um the next week we'd be ending this month that is on february 28 with a very interesting quiz conducted by uh, dr akshay nair um we can we'll be hosting this on the youtube platform but you can also answer the questions on the kahoot app so download your kahoot app and be ready for this amazing session by a dynamic um, teacher and a dynamic professor thank you all good night thank you good night